us to deliver it with pace and energy. Just want to say you have seen the recording so I'll just go on um, that this event is being recorded uh, and that's because there are other people who wanted to come today who, who, who weren't able to and we want to be able to share, share the conversation that we have um, going on today. So we've got a packed room and um, with many of us carving out time to engage in the discussion, what lies beyond BAME, if anything, and alongside academics and professional services staff, we do have with us today some people who are, um, uh, some people who are from other sectors um, and, and from nursing, for healthcare, for example. So welcome to you today and hope we don't use too many acronyms. Um, HERAG's always attracted many participants to its think tanks over the year. But this year, I noted the speed with which um, the, pro, uh, the people joined us. It was incredible. It was sold out within minutes. And that's quite an unusual thing. Um, I just want to say that it's obvious that the topic we're discussing today is an important issue and one which needs to be um, um, given the time and the consideration. And um, so it's really important that we, we, we all contribute today and, and say um, what we need to. I am going to ask you to do something. Can you please tweet as well, hashtag beyond BAME lowercase. Um, and um, I just also want to say, if you haven't done so already, please do switch off your cameras and your mics. So it reduces the bandwidth issues that people will have. So, um, when I, um, can you put on the slide which goes through the order of the day? Thank you. I, I'd just like to run through the order of the day with you. So we do have um, um, a overview of the stimulus paper and personal reflections by, by, by the contributors to the paper. So that's Dr. Gurnam Singh, Dr. Chrissy De Costa, and of course, uh, Stephen Dixon-Smith, which is incredibly, um, uh, a fantastic paper. And I, I was so pleased to be asked to do the foreword for that as well. Uh, we'll then be looking at um, alternative to BAME, uh, the results of the opinion poll that was set up and, uh, and Dr. Richard Hillier is going to be taking us through that um, with Mushrap and um, who's the senior lecturer at South Bank, as you can see. And then um, Gannon's gonna to give us the kind of the results of the live poll from the breakout uh, groups to uh, are followed by breakout groups to reflect on the findings. Um, and that will be led by Karen Lipsedge, um, who is um, going to be shepherdessing us through that process. And then we'll come back to a panel session with um, um, the, uh, our keynotes, our panel members, which is Dr. Arun Verma um, and Larissa Kennedy and um, Sundar Katwala. So, um, uh, um, we'll be wrapping up with uh, reflections from Car Dr. Karen Lipsed and then finishing at um, four o'clock. So quite a packed agenda today and we hope to get to, to get through everything that we want to. So when I was asked to, to, to think about, you know, forwarding the paper, I was absolutely delighted. You know, of the 30 years I've advocated for race equity in higher education, you know, we regularly revisited this term and you know, every now and then it bubbles up as a key issue. Um, so it's interesting that at the moment it's got such momentum. And I think it's a really important discussion to have. Um, when, I, when I've gone through my own career uh, uh, and my own life, um, I, I do think it's really uh, interesting to think about um, how we describe ourselves. And I'm always torn as a, as a practitioner about whether or not to use the term, because obviously by using the term, I can use it to identify and then report and then demand action based on those differentials because I can talk about them. Um, however, by doing that, I'm also entering into maybe the kind of like um, othering and that process of othering or creating difference, highlighting difference. So, there is a, there's this real kind of tension that I have faced about whether or not to support the use of terms or not. Um, and Gernon's going to talk about that uh, with the others. But I think as a, I, I, I like to refer to myself now um, as a person of colour, that's my preference, but I recognise it's not everybody else's preference. Um, and sometimes 
I, I feel like going, what is it? What, what is this vain nonsense? You know, why do we have to label ourselves? Because sometimes labeling ourselves is quite um, challenging uh, for ourselves because it pigeonholes us and it creates these false identities. I am an Indian who was of Indian heritage, who was born in Liberia in West Africa and then moved to India uh, for a number of years and then came over to live in the United, uh, United Kingdom. Um, and I, and I, you know, how would you label me in my experiences? It would be very difficult. But nevertheless, sometimes the data does capture my experiences through the ceilings that I will face, the barriers I will face through my life cycle data so I can see that it's important. But at the end of it, whether we choose to to go forward with the conversations around whether we keep fame or not, and where we end up. I do want to say, for me, um, it, is, it is really important to, to recognise that um, we are not all the same. And because of the diversity of human nature, we will never, ever come to an agreement. And that's the beauty of it. That's why the debate is really important. And on my last line on this, before I hand over to, to, to Gernon, is Gernon is to say, actually, I just want to be, and that's an important thing for people of colour to be, to just be, um, because when you look at your white counterparts, they never have the debate. Um, and it's an interesting place to be um, in, in that position where you can just be who you are without a label. So I'm going to proudly hand over to Gunam and um, let him introduce himself and then move on to the next section of the, the agenda. Thanks for that, Nonna, and fantastic timekeeping as well. Um, we we are very we are very kind of um you know the time is very tight this afternoon so we're not going to be able to allow participants to come on uh, in in any significant numbers so if you have any comments thoughts questions especially for the panel maybe or in response to what we say if you stick them on the discussion forum we're all kind of keep an eye on them and we'll try and pick them up and respond to them um so um I know I'm not on the full PowerPoint kind of presentation now I deliberately because I. When it does that, I kind of get lost in the whole kind of technology. So I'm going to stick with this slightly lower tech version. Um, so just for about the next 20 minutes, I'm going to just uh, uh, do a quick overview of the paper. I mean, there's a lot of detail there. We won't be able to cover everything. Uh, and then my colleagues, Chrissy and Steve, will share some of their own reflections as kind of as it were being part of uh, doing this paper and, and their own perspectives as well. But the context, I think, uh, around this debate is that in some senses, and, and pot, not just because of George Floyd, but before as well, I think societal institutional attention to race, ethnicity, racism has never been greater. And that doesn't mean that that's necessarily a, a good, uh, good, good place to be, but it's an issue that doesn't go away. And, and I think in recent years, there's been significant levels of dissatisfaction with the with, with the acronym ban, ban. And that's been from below and from above in a sense. You know, the government recently, you will know the CRED report, the Sewell report. One of the major recommendations was, you know, I'm quoting, BAM should be dropped in official government research reports. The acronym ban is both demeaning to non-white communities and it masks significant differences in outcomes between ethnic groups. And there was quite a lot of chatter on the higher education research action here at GLIST of the need to, for a new category or to try and decide whether we can come together on one. So we formed a small action group and, uh, and we decided that we would be useful to put a paper together, a discussion paper, stimulus paper to maybe to try and go a bit deeper and then and, and today's event as well. So that's what we did. And, and the brief that we set ourselves for the paper was to offer a critical commentary on the historical and contemporary politics of counting and categorization um, and uh, also try and capture the debate around the kind of key issues around the BAME category. But we didn't want to be prescriptive about saying, well, we think this is an alternative. Uh, so what we did was we offered a number of uh, alternatives uh, for people to kind of think about. Uh, and I'll come back, I'll come back to those. But just in terms of the historical context, you know, problematizing and classifying, categorizing and labeling people is, is, is really kind of dodgy because at one level, how do we recognize peoples without using a category, but then avoid that category becoming, you know, essentialist given the kind of 
history of, of, of categorization and particularly around race and that image kind of just captures some of that. So as well as offering a basis for ethnic pride and national identification, we know that such markers of difference through proxies of othering can act as a proxy for determining model worth, superior or inferiority, belonging, non-belonging. And whereas the former deployment ethnic differentiation has been driven by desire to promote equity and justice, the latter has served as a tool for justification for inequity, racism, ethnic cleansing and genocide. So, you know, it's a, it's, it's a really important and, and risky area of categorization. Um, and there is another problem with categorizing, particularly maybe, maybe in the higher education sector, which is quite kind of international now, is that the students come from different places. And, you know, the, the kind of labels and the terms that we might devise in this country necessarily mean nothing in those other countries, yeah? In other places, ethnicity might be a proxy for nationality, for citizenship or race. So it's a kind of, again, that creates another complication if we're thinking about the kind of body, particularly in higher education of students and staff uh, from all over the world. So, you know, we might use the term black uh, in the context of it was a political term, but you know, I've had students saying we feel insulted when you use the term black. So these 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 are kind of complex issues to navigate. Um, so just uh, and and I suppose not everybody universally despises the BAME category, although there's been significant kind of problematization. It's actually an old criticism that's resurfacing in the kind of nineties when you know we were using black as a kind of term. Uh, that was critiqued uh, as particular from people like Tariq Madud. It's too blunt. You can't really build policy around such an imprecise kind of category. Uh, and then there were other criticisms that many Asians do not like, do not identify as being black. Um, and, and, and there was also what Steve Hall's work on the shift towards ethnic kind of politics of difference, if you like, ethnic identification and pride. Um, and more recently, criticisms, um, Deborah Gabriel says that BAM just homogenizes minoritized people into one big cluster while the white category is never named as an ethnicity. So I think what uh, Deborah's saying is that, in a sense, this just represents the white gaze. Um, excludes people of mixed heritage, I've said, and, or those who don't identify as black or Asian, or at least that is the perception that we're getting. So there are good reasons why we need to interrogate this category. Of course, one of the dangers of, of, of going away uh, and saying we won't have any category is kind of what the Sewell report says is that we just go for self-identification. Is that, uh, you know, certainly labels are imposed, but sometimes they're fought for as well. Just for example, you know, the category black was fought for, it was a political struggle. And some people, and, and, and that BAME was in a sense an imposition. Uh, so, you know, the, the category Asian, I mean, that actually is another colonial category. It was a category that was invented by the British government to describe the uh, East African Asians, particularly those that were excluded from Uganda. Um, and the logic of the CRED report is that because there is no evidence of in, uh, institutional racism, which they conclude, and some ethnic groups are doing very well in comparison to each other, and poor whites, uh, there is no need for racialized binaries any longer. And that sounds like a good thing that we're on a kind of post-racial trajectory. Uh, and for debates about race and anti-racism in the UK, this would in effect concede the end of what W.E. Du Bois termed the color line. Uh, and the quote from his famous text back in the early part of the 20th century was, uh, the problem of the uh, 20th century is the problem of the color line. The relationship of the darker to the lighter races of men in Asia and Africa and America and the islands of the seas. So it, it's a major departure from maybe the kind of binarism. And in doing such a move would undermine maybe the claims of critical race theory, or at least its relevance to understanding and framing the challenge uh, of racial disadvantage in the UK. So I think it raises some interesting questions. So what we did do in the report was that we just offered a number of alternatives and then, you know, um, so one was no category at all that we just simply use uh, disaggregated kind of labels, which is kind of where the so report comes in. There are a problem that all labels are imprecise and will reflect significant variations. So how much disaggregation do you do? You know, the Indian category, I mean, India is 1.3 billion, you know, Gujaratis, Punjabis, Tamils, et cetera, Kashmiris, do you begin to then unravel those labels? African, you know, I mean, uh, you know, you, you could go for hundreds of different ethnic groups. 
it probably masks super diversity as well or internal differentiation in groups. Uh, and we slip into that post-racial logic that I talked about, which may actually end up delegitimizing the case for institutional racism and then open up new grounds for racial pathologization. So just very quickly, we did have uh, some options and, and you know, we'll talk about the poll. One was racialized minor, uh, racially minoritized. And certainly this avoids presenting racialized groups as minorities and that's one of the kind of critiques. And it emphasizes the process of racialization, yeah? Uh, and, and also maybe not blaming the victims of racism in, in the, you're, you're focusing on the racialization process. But it does present people maybe as passive victims of racialization and could also go into the victimhood and says nothing about kind of whiteness really, you know, the racially majoritized, if you like. Um, global majority is another one. My colleague, uh, Gus, Professor Gus John, has been uh, advocating this term. And it's a reminder that global majorities are actually racially, racially minoritized in places like the UK. And it fosters maybe a more positive sense of collective identity. Uh, but I suppose some of the kind of problems is that it could feed into the kind of majoritarianism as well. And the rights, you know, from how the rights of majorities in one point. And maybe it's too abstract as well to kind of have an empirical value. So I'm just conscious of time. So I'm just rushing through these. I'm sure some of you will be familiar with these. The other one is people have got, Nonna just said that she, she, she prefers that. And that, that seems to be quite widely used now. Uh, and this is a trying to, you know, as it were, to, to reclaim the language to, because certainly in, when we grew up, you know, to be co called colored was to be, to be like a racist slur uh, <clears throat> and a rejection of color coded racism. Uh, and it has political connections with the term black in terms of confront stigmatizing people with pigmentation that is different from, you know, the dominant white kind of. Uh, and um, in the US, it's kind of that, that seems to be an acceptable term that's brought widely used. Um, as I say, it does sit uncomfortably with maybe racist labels and some people might misinterpret that. Uh, I, I may not be an improvement on BAME. And, and there are other kind of, you know, cons as well. Another one is, you know, just ethnic minority or eth eth ethnically minoritized. And again, that takes us away from seeing ethnicity in monolithic terms. Focusing on ethnicity, one can develop more nuanced and granular inclusive approaches, yeah? Uh, and the minoritized allows for recognition that people aren't minority as such, but that they're positioned. Um, but again, in the context of the wider debate regarding the issue of structural racism and colonialism and ongoing legacies, there is a real danger that by emphasizing ethnic differences, one may end up pitching minorities against each other. And if you look at the work of Franz Fanon, this was one of the kind of strategies of, of, of colonialism, which was to get, get, get black or colonized people fighting for the uh, crumbs, yeah. So I'm gonna hand over to my colleagues now um, for them to just share some of their reflections. Uh, I'll probably, Chrissy, did you want to put your camera on? And Steve, put yours on as well, and, and maybe your mic and, over to you. Thank you, Gunnar. Um, I, I just like to share a few uh, concerns and reflections that I have on this practice of labeling. One, I think, is why uh, why are there some labels, uh, why some people are not labeled? So for instance, you have labels like uh, people of color, POC, or you have BAME, but there isn't a label WME. So that seems that there is domination, discrimination, some people are considered to be the norm and do not need to be uh, have a label imposed on them. So that's my one concern. The second one I have is that in this struggle or challenging uh, the practice of labeling, are we in a way kind of accepting the, the stratified positioning, the unequal power relations? So that's something that I, I think that we need to kind of grapple with. And the third point that concerns me in, in uh, having uh, worked on this paper and engaged in this uh, deliberation discussion on, on labeling is that I think I need to acknowledge that in challenging labeling, the practice of labeling and the labels being imposed, I am in a position of privilege because there are millions on this planet who do, who do not have the opportunity or the choice to discuss um, how they identified or what labels or what position they have in society. They ha have a more basic struggle, a struggle for existence, a struggle for survival. So while on, on the one hand, some of us are struggling for our, our identities, our positioning, 
or, or the labels. There are others who have a more basic human struggle. So I think uh, that's something that I just want to share that uh, that's the concern that I have. Although I worked on this paper, it's a concern that is there. And, and I think we need to be mindful and respectful of, uh, of that. Thank you. Thanks, Karnam. And now hand over to Steve. Thanks for that, Chrissy. And just to say thanks to, I mean, she, she made a ma fantastic contribution to the paper. And so really kind of valued that as well. So just over to Steve then. Yeah, I, I guess just to just to begin with that as well, to 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 thank sincerely Jenna and, and, and Chrissy for the um for for um my, my involvement in this project um with you and, the, and everything that I learned um through our discussions. It was a, a real privilege and a, and a pleasure um to be involved. Um I just want to reflect very briefly really on a on a particular point that was made in the report in the context of today's event. Um and it and it draws on the work of uh Sibo Canavana. Um, the, the point in the report is this, uh, uh, it, it says, the starting point in addressing this issue of labeling and counting is recognition of the role played by whiteness in producing, legitimizing, and stabilizing categories of non-whiteness. So in, in that context, I, today feels like a, a really important step in devising a way forward that unsettles this process by acknowledging the role played by structures of whiteness but also in, in dismantling this power to name and to categorize by speaking back from the positions that these structures create and seek to name. Um, so I, I'm grateful to, to Gunnar and, and all the other organizers for today uh, as an opportunity to listen to and learn from that voice about the way that we move forward. And I look forward to, to, to the discussions and to the ongoing work that will follow from it. Thanks. Okay. Um, th thanks for that, Steve. Um, both of you are super efficient in your reflections, which means we've probably got a, a few minutes. If anybody does want to come in, um, we can probably let you in now. So if, if there's anybody, if you can kind of raise your hand, we can probably take a comment on anything that you've heard so far, but it'd be very brief. Otherwise, I will just hand over to uh, Richard to... I think probably it's better if we kind of maybe just keep keep... You keep kind of piling on with, 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 with the survey. So, Richard, can I um ask you to uh, take over now and uh, and also Nushat as well? Yeah, Mushrat, thank you. Yeah, so I'll I'll hand over to you, Richard and Mushrat, and you can. Thank you, Gernam. Yeah. Can you? I've got to ask the question that everybody asks. Can you see the screen? Yeah, yeah. But, Can't okay. see you though, Richard. Maybe you could switch on your camera. Yeah. I'm a bit hesitant because I've got a problem with bandwidth. Okay, so, well, it's a nice picture anyway. <laughs> probably better than the reality, so there we go. Right, so a quick introduction. My name is Richard. I'm the Widening Opportunity Manager at Covent University, and I'm delighted to say that Musharat, um, who is an occupational therapist, senior lecturer from London South Bank, is um, joining us. Um, so basically, well, this presentation is on the back of the stimulus paper that Gernam and Nana was talking about. And it was looking at the semantic classifications. And now Gernham, to, to develop that discussion, Gernham asked me um, to set up a poll. So the poll presented the series of classifications that have already been detailed. Um, and it enabled participants to choose their first choice, second choice, and then the third choice preference. And I think also more pertinent and probably more value is it enabled a free text response. And I think actually it was within that text that the real value of the findings uh, are apparent. So let's see if this works. So I'm going to be presenting the data. Um, I'm presenting the survey data. Musharat's talking about the thematic analysis uh, of the free text. And um, there we go. These slides will be available, by the way, after the presentation. And before I start talking about this, I would like to do a quick disclaimer. This isn't robust empirical research. All this is, is a quick and dirty survey to generate opinion, or to, to understand opinion and generate a discussion. So I think the first thing is we had a huge response, 1,287 participants undertook this survey. I wish uh, that was the kind of engagement I had on all the research that I've sometimes done. Really phenomenal response. And um, the vast majority of the participants come from an educational background but also health, so other, um, a lot of people identified as health, social care, 21%, and, and then other 12%. 
I think the first finding is that initially I was going to cross tabulate and see if there was a difference in preference by the sector of the participant. And I did do that analysis as a, as a quick rough and dirty, but, but actually there was no difference. So irrespective of which sector um, was identified by the participant, it didn't impact upon the preference of the semantic classifications. So using broad brush analysis, as I say, I think that if you look at the second table, the slightly lower down, you can see that the no, cat and the no category preference had the highest number of responses on 27.7%, and that was followed by people of color and then BAME. To try and come up with a definitive, not that I think any of us thought that that was possible, we then decided to look at the second and third preferences. So we did a series of rounds by eliminating the classification with the smallest percentage. Uh, and then we almost transferred them votes to the second and third preference to see if we could come up with a, a clear winner as such. So we did this three times that signified by round two, round three and round four, eliminating in the sequence, racially minoritized, then the other, and then the global majority. And as I say, this isn't robust evidence, but. But as you can see by the percentage column on the far right hand side of this slide, the, there just wasn't a clear consensus within the participants. And interestingly, um, for the no category preference, that had the highest percentage all the way through. And I will now pass on to the really interesting bit, which was the thematic uh, analysis. Thematic analysis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, yes, yeah, so this is my quick and dirty thematic analysis uh, presentation. Next slide, please, Richard. So there was a 1,287 survey submitted and 309 populated the comments box. Um, and what did I do to get my 13 subcategories? I did very low tech. I took a highlighter pen and line by line highlighted the comments that were about labeling or identity. Then I regrouped through pulling out repetitions or patterns and recognizing the groups by allocating them a group number. Once I completed this, I tried to understand what it is that the content collectively was telling me or describing. And this led to the 13 subcategories that you see. Next slide, please, Richard. So please, I'm not expecting you to be able to read the slide content, but I wanted to give you a visual sense of the amount of responses. In the comments, some added another choice to add to the three preferences from the seven choices already provided in the survey. They wanted a fourth preference, which were semantic permutations of existing categories. Um, I'll just read a few. People who are discriminated was one, non-Caucasian or racially or ethnically marginalized. These are just examples. And this was um, C in my list of subcategories, which I labeled fourth choice, but should be named fourth preference. I think that's a better way to describe it. Next slide, please. So when reading the quotes, what I could feel is the frustration coming off the survey you know, coming off the comments, frustration of having a label, frustration in having to choose a label for the survey, and really not wanting to have the conversation on labeling. And I mean, on there you have, I don't like any of the others, um, but had to select to complete. Um, and the last one there, I feel extremely uncomfortable with this as I believe it is not for white people to be deciding on how a person of color wants to be called. And some did offer suggestions within their comments on how to move forward. For example, they suggested us people what they wanted their identity label to be. 
in any kind of survey or forms. Next slide, please. So I was able to collapse those 13 subcategories into three overarching themes. Um, so the first theme, this relates well to the highest response result of no category in the quantitative analysis. And then the second overarching theme, this is telling us whatever group label we have, um, whatever group label we have, we have to place a critical lens on it to be transparent about the rationale for choosing that label, that group label, and the boundaries of its usability. And then the last theme, and this was a standalone overarching theme, and this really identified that um, labels could be of benefit in enabling organizations to shape their services pro-equitably. And I think that's it. That's the qualitative part completed. Thank you. Thank you for that, Musharat. And you know, there's lots, lots more there. Um, so thank you to Richard as well for your both of your contributions there. As I say, it was a quick and dirty survey. It wasn't rigorous. And and one of the questions that was raised is, well, you know, could anybody, uh, you know, express their opinion? And that was the case. So we didn't distinct. We didn't. We don't know if it's white people and black people. I know somebody put a comment as to you know why we, it shouldn't allow a racist to have a comment. I suppose the difficulty is there is that how do you determine who is a racist and who isn't? So it's a you know is it normal tabit cricket test or something? What we do we're going to do now is just this is just a bit of fun uh, before we, before we uh, let you go into groups to maybe discuss some of the, this is just to do a quick poll. We just see whether uh, whether uh, <clears throat> you know what people think and. And, and whether the, the, the survey that we've done can, is confirmed by our poll of, we've got about almost 200 people on the conference now. I'm gonna launch this poll. So if you can just maybe um, have a bash eye and let, and we'll see, yeah? So let's see, you just probably need to do your first choice and see where, where things fall. <clears throat> Let's see where we're going. I feel like I should be like a racing, you know, these commentators at the races. Um, racially minoritized, uh, uh, people of color now edging it. My, my, my career as a, as, a, as a horse racing commentator has probably ended before it began. Okay, so there's some. Um, I mean, I think uh, Richard, you might want to come in here, given that you know, the, comparing the, the the survey with this, but it seems to be you know mirroring a, a, a lot of what we've already confirmed. It's it's pretty much split. Um, any any comments, Richard or Mushrat? Mushrat. Is anything surprising there, Richard, or do you think that um, that that that's probably I think, yeah, on, Sorry, I, think. I can't I can't see anything worse. Oh. Can you see that can can people see the poll? Can you see the poll, Richard? We can see the options, but we cannot see the risk. The, oh, the... Right. <laughs> okay. It's, I wonder why that is the case, but I can see it anyway. So I'll tell you what the um the score is. Yeah, 84% have voted so far. So we've got about 150. So no category has got um 17%. Stick with the BAME has got 21%. So that's about a fifth of people think maybe it's the kind of, you know, better the devil you know than the devil you don't know. Racially minoritized has got 24%, um, which is the, one of the strong global majority has got 14%. That, 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 I mean, my friend Gus John might want to ponder on that one. People of color has got 24%. So that's, that seems to be something that's kind of you know, becoming much more acceptable and ethnically minoritized, Richard, I think that was one that you, your preference, wasn't it? Uh, that's got 14%. So that, 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 that's, the, that's the figures. I, I, can't, I don't know why people can't see that. I don't know if it's something to do with my screen, yeah? 
Um, it might be. Let me. Just, I don't know. I'm not going to. I don't. Gonna, I don't think it shows much. Uh, and, much difference, does it? In the no, um, no, no. It, it's it's probably the same. Okay, I'm going to. What we're going to do now? I'm going to hand over to Karen just to. Um, so Karen, if you can, I'll bring your slide. I'll bring the slides up if you can. So I'm going to end that poll now. And uh, oh yeah, okay. Sorry, I can share the results. Sorry, it's me. Can you see the results now, guys? Yeah. Yeah. There you are. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's me not not knowing how to use that tool properly. Um. So there they are. Yeah. I'll just leave them from the ten seconds. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing now. Right. I'm just going to um. Just close that. Share screen. Yeah, over to you, Karen. Okay, so thank you. So we've got a lot to think about. We've just gone through the re results of the data from the poll that closed just before this this event and then we've just had the data from the from the live poll um for us to go into smaller breakout rooms and to talk about ethnic and racial categorization or the mechanism that you think should be used to capture the collective experiences of racism in our institutions so i'm using that phrase from the stimulus paper because i think that really helps to contain what these categories could or perhaps should about um, up until three o'clock to consider the following questions. So on one side, you will see that we've got the options. And then on the other side, you've got some questions to think about it a bit from the personal perspective. So thinking about the racial, um, how you would um, define your, your own ethnic and racial identity, identity, what category you may use or think is appropriate. And then on to the professionals. So thinking about in terms of your institution, what do you think is the most appropriate racial or ethnic and ethnic um, category to refer to the racial um, an ethnic identity of staff and students. And that's going to be drawing in a number of factors that are going to help you to, to think about what the most appropriate is. And then we've got that next step. So what are we doing after it as well as think in the present moment? Um, and, and thinking a bit, there was a point that was raised in the stimulus paper about how do we facilitate a dialogue? How do we facilitate a conversation in our institutions about using appropriate forms of racial and ethnic categorization. Um, and what are the mechanisms that we may use to do that? So what we're going to do now is, so those are your questions. Um, we're gonna go into our breakout rooms any minute now. What you will see on your screen, you'll, you'll be familiar with this by now, I think, is that flashing warning sign when the time is about to run out, you're about to be kicked out of your room back into the larger room okay are we okay. ready are you ready yeah, i'm gonna well i'm gonna yeah i'm gonna put the questions in the chat for you good point thank you hang on just one okay um just just give me a minute um i just need to create uh recreate okay reassign automatically re Okay, uh, just to give give you just have a minute to reflect and maybe put comments down. I did reach. All oh, right, here we are. Okay. Okay, so this I'm going to create thirty rooms. That'll be about four four or five to each room. That's about good. Yeah. Okay, and so we haven't got any facilitators. So you're going to have to facilitate yourself, and. Um, Open all rooms. Okay. You you should have been invited to join a room now, yeah. Okay. 
So we'll be in there for about 15 minutes. And I've put in the chat the um, document so everyone's got access to that. Excellent, yeah. Oh yeah, everybody. Maybe we can all kind of unmute now and uh, show our faces. Hi, Gordon. I was just saying, I'm, all, I'm I'm actually on my phone and I'm out and about, so I'm sort of right. multitasking, so I can't really come on. But I'm I'm here. So Jill Stevenson, hello. Hi. Oh, Gordon. We're both in this room. So do you want me to stay or? Yeah. I mean, I I don't know how I'm going to reallocate. I just don't. That technology is beyond me. Yeah, I'm yeah. just happy that we, we've got into a room. <laughs> we might all get ejected into outer space. So, um, maybe people can come in and just share some reflections or whether there've been conversations already been taking place. Yeah, I mean, is it an issue that we should be concerned about for devoting our attention to? Anybody want to come in? Who wants? What's it? Yeah, Donovan. Yeah, just hello there. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the chance to uh, to um, have a, have a, this discussion. I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple of things strike me really. Um, and I was in an event earlier in the day, uh, and, and it was a uh, um, sort of student representative talking about um, it, the necessity of doing the work and and saying that you know that don't get hung up on the terms. Really, I guess that's something I kind of find myself sort of chiming to. Uh, just a sense that we, you know, we, we all have finite amounts of energy um, and uh, I guess the struggle is long and hard, frankly. It feels like, like that quite a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, you know, we need to conserve our energies and, and focus on the things that make change happen and to a lesser degree um, get involved in the kind of the, the fraught language games really where no one can agree on a set of terms and that, that's almost true of any sort of fraught concept. Mm. You know, there'll be diverging perspectives and it's, it, it, it detracts from doing the work, I think. That's, what, that's kind of my thing where my thoughts are going. Um, Sorry. I'm, okay. Okay. <laughs> I've just flown in from one room to another, so... Um, Gernam, I've just put a, a, a message up. Can we put the questions that we're supposed to be considering into the main chat? Because that can be accessed from all the breakout rooms. I thought it was. Um, I've not seen it. Yeah. I mean, I basically, you know, what is our perspective on this and how can we facilitate conversations or whether it's an issue that we need to devote any time to anyway, whether it's a side issue. I mean, that's basically what, what it is. Yeah. I don't know if anybody's got any thoughts about that um, but while you're doing that i'll try and dig out the questions yeah yeah thanks um, I mean, I'm kind of, as kind of a white person that that, that it's not to, up to me to tell categories and, and i also want to feel that i'm using the right categories and not the wrong categories mm. you know um, so 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 i think my position is to be led way that it's not, you know, because as we've been the ones who've always done the labeling, that that decision needs to be made. I mean, I tend to use people of color because it kind of works globally a little mm -hmm. bit more. Um, but even then I'm not comfortable because I mm -hmm. don't know whether I'm doing the right thing or not. Yeah. I just don't know. What are the questions is, uh, Colette, that in a sense, it's become, I mean, at the one level, it's a white person's gaze. Uh, you know, white people don't want to get involved, but it's yeah. white people that are kind of in, in some sense imposing some of the structures. So it's not that yeah. easy to kind of say nothing to do with me, mate. Yeah. Well, it's everything to do with the white gaze, isn't it? I mean, I don't know what other people think. Precious, what do you think? Do you think that there is this sense of part of the whole kind of categorization is really about mm -hmm. coloniality? It's about an imposition and, and yeah, I don't know what you think, Precious. Um, so I think, I think it's really difficult because mm. I know that the way I want to identify is not going to be the same way that other people <coughs> who may look like me would like to identify. 
And I think the problem that I'm trying to wrap my head around is the use of, of labels, because I think that although labels are, you know, often frowned upon, it's through the use of labels that we are able to see some of the um, institutional racism and we're able to gather certain mm -hmm. data to say, hold on a minute, why is it that this percentage of black people yeah. or vain people achieve this, whereas with the attainment gap, white people achieve mm -hmm. so much more. So mm -hmm. I think I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with the, um, the, revel the use of labels because I understand their relevance, but then I also understand that they don't necessarily mm -hmm. capture how everyone self-identifies. Mm -hmm. So that's my thought process at the moment. And the other thing, just linking it back to my previous point, others can come in, is that the advantage group, as it were, never has to have a label, you know. And, and, and so, so does that mean that if we get rid of labels for ourselves, we will then become advantaged or will it mean that we become erased? The disadvantage becomes erased. I don't know what other people think. Owen, have you got any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's... it's from my side, it's I, I always want people to be able to label themselves and refer to themselves as they want to be. And, and I think that's really important. And I think discussions like this are important to make sure that we're current and people are having their views heard and that, that we can keep as current as possible. Um, for me, as, as, as a white person in this line of, of work, I, I think it's really important to, that I see sometimes the discussions around the labeling as, as potentially get a barrier in, into moving the work forwards. But at the same time, we need to ensure that people can have the conversations, can have their voices heard and, and that it's, it's, it's it enables us to, to try and move forwards with, with the work. Yeah. So it, it's a bit of a juxtaposition with regards to the actual conversation around the labeling. Yeah. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I like to disaggregate and I will always disaggregate as far as possible all the time. Yeah. Um, my work is mainly based around data and evidence. So aggregation <clears throat> is... So we'll be disaggregating the white category as well then? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Wherever possible. And I think it's Does important... Does it mean dropping the white? Yeah. Because if, if we're saying that we want... We, and partly we want to drop the black here yeah, because it's black. It was either BAME or BME or black. If we're going to drop, because if you're going to go for ethnicity, then you drop the black because black isn't an ethnicity. Yeah. Does it mean that we have to drop the white? Do we stop being black and white people? That's the key question, which is kind of what the Sewell report is pushing us towards. Yeah, uh, I think the problem with that is that then it's it it gets in the way of progress with the work mm. of, of, of identifying the differentiated outcomes of, of different groups yeah. of students. Mm. And mm. and that's the last thing that we want to do is yeah, is, yeah. is stop that. Work. We might lose. We might. It's like baby in the bathwater, isn't it? Heber, yeah, I don't absolutely. know what are your thoughts, Heber. Because I mean, if you were, uh, when I was doing my presentation, one of the reasons why we went away from the category black was the work of, uh, um, uh, what's his name at Bristol University, I mentioned him, uh, uh, who was saying that the Muslim discrimination was being masked in this kind of category uh, and, the, and, and that we needed to disaggregate these. Uh, but the question is, where would you stop disaggregating? Well, I think there's two different strands here. Um, sometimes we need to disaggregate, like Precious said, sometimes we need to look at um, which particular group is receiving, you know, the brunt of the, the discrimination and, and so on. And sometimes, and, and this is extremely important, we need to think of groups that have the common experience of discrimination and we need solidarity we and i underline this we need solidarity between the different groups who experience discrimination on all fronts you know employment um, the attainment or rather um, um the awarding gap and so on and so forth so we need to work together different groups in uh, in solidarity but at the same time so, the, under certain circumstances we do need to disaggregate um the terms available are very restricting because you know the human experience is like I'm um, um, I was born in Egypt and that's mm -hmm. an African country um, it's facts of life you know mm -hmm. however the, the way people 
you know, look at me and think Muslim, but that's mm. a different, like that's just one part of a very complex identity, mm. you know, that includes so many things. It, it does include Islam, but it also includes, you know, being African and mm. um, includes being an Arabic speaker and so on and so forth. There isn't a particular easy category, except perhaps North African that can, yeah, yeah, you know, include all this, and I and I just don't find, for instance, the term North African anywhere, and yeah. I'd rather use the term African, but then I worry that other people would, you know, think that I'm trying to appropriate or whatever. So I, I think we need to take into consideration yeah. the complexities of, of people's identities, yeah. but at the same time work, you know, together in solidarity. Yeah, sorry. No, that, that's a great point. So I, I, you know, I think in a sense that that's kind of paradox, but yeah, pressure. You will need to come back in. Yeah, I just wanted to make a quick point. So, um, <clears throat> part of my work in the Race Equality Charter, we've had some engagement events. And one of the things that came up was uh, we're, we're pushing for like an anti blackness in our, in our strategy. And someone mentioned, well, you know, don't you think that's going to create a hierarchy in terms of the racialized groups and who, who gets to be at the top of that hierarchy and which agenda and who do you mm -hmm. prioritize? Mm -hmm. And I think it's opened up a, another box that. When we disaggregate, um, this is what the civil, civil report was also pushing for. That mm -hmm. you know, everyone's let's just let's look at everyone individually. But then you realize that then we start pitting ethnicities against each other to say, mm -hmm. let's mm -hmm. focus on this one because this one doesn't need so much help, or these ones are doing mm -hmm. well. And I think we also need to consider these when we are looking at disaggregating and um, and yeah. That's a really important point. And if you look at the literature on when the, the term black in, in the UK in the 70s emerged, it was partly out of that, exp that reflexive reflection on the colonial strategies, where, which was pitching colonized peoples against colonized peoples. So that was a very political kind of stance that was taken that whether we are, you know, whether we are from Africa or Asia or even some Irish people, you know, that we are kind of black in the sense that we are all victims or the products of British colonization, yeah? Uh, but this would certainly take us away from, from, from that kind of way of framing it as a political kind of identity. Um, what about this? People of color seems to be one that's quite become a bit fashionable uh, and that still retains this sense that it, it is not white people, yeah? What about that? You're smiling, Heba. Yeah, it's the fashion. The fashions change all the time. That, like, I find my students refer to this as the black and brown people all the time. This is like the latest fashion, and um, mm. I use people of color now to show how Americanized and and <laughs> um, down with the kids I am. Uh, mm. You know, I'm Insta on Twitter, everything. Mm. Um, <laughs> but just when I got used to saying people of color, my students have moved on, and they now say. Um, um, well, white is a color, so we say black and brown. I'm just trying to catch up. Mm -hmm. I, th I think from my side, I, I find, I understand, you know, how terminologies change and, and, and trends with terminology and, and absolutely accept that. Um, I, I struggle with people of color because of the, the racist connotations from, from historical kind of sides. And, you know, I, I've, I've never used the term myself, but I absolutely understand and, and accept other people using it as, as people should. But um, I, I struggle with the term myself. Yeah. I mean, one of the interesting things is that in the Victorian times, working class people were seen to be dark people, that, that, that whiteness was associated with high upper classness because mm. they were clean they could there was evidence that they could wash or put creams on their face and working and, and they weren't working out in the fields so it's it, it's kind of interesting how our memories are kind of quite short-lived in terms of where these things come from as well i mean that still continues today as well if, if you look at china and taiwan and yeah. places like that it's you know People and wander it, around underneath umbrellas yeah. so that they don't become more tanned, so that they don't get That's associated right. with And in classes. India, I think in India, the whole kind of thing about skin lightening is, is a mixture of the kind of colonial uh, influence about whiteness, but also the kind of caste system in India where mm -hmm. lower caste people were out in the fields, uh, in the sun, so they and, and the upper caste people could remain indoors so they weren't as burnt. I don't know if there's similar stuff in 
in African contexts as well. Uh, I know that in in South America, you had in some contexts they had that sense of lighter, you know, kind of colorism, as it were. Mm. Yeah. Mm. This colorism in in most communities, mm. um, and I think any any you know region or people mm. who have been through a colonial experience will have some sort of colorism especially like you know modern colonialism is European largely speaking mm. so uh, people tend to look at the masters the colonizers as you know superior having said that uh, in North Africa the term um, um, not people of color but colored people mean people who have excessive color as in literally that the terms yellow hair blue eyes this is sort of not normal i guess from people's experiences so they have too many colors yellow blue green so they're called colored people um and not pejorative but just to describe the fact that there's too many colors happening yeah yeah it's very interesting yeah I mean, so just going back to the instit uh, our institutions, what I've seen that's been happening is now different workplaces, different institutions have begun to say, well, this is what we will use. I mean, that creates some problems because it's it's still a kind of a majority kind of majority, it, you know, it just takes away the kind of self-definition. But I suppose if you're going to have groups, then you have to have some kind of way of categorizing those groups, you know. I mean, I don't know whether in, in your organizations you have a, because they used to be called black workers groups when I was around in local authority, then they became BAME, then they became minority. I don't know, have you got groups and do they have any names to them? I don't know, within your organizations? We've just had a, a um, we're actually in the process of doing a survey at the University <laughs> of Brighton. <laughs> so we were using the term BAME like most other institutions. Um, but then um, last summer after the, the murder of George Floyd, the students you know, demanded racial equality. So yeah. the University of Brighton in you know, all its wisdom um, set up the race terminology group to find a new term and hence <laughs> achieve um, racial equality. I'm not, you know, I, I, I sit on the race equality, race, sorry, mm -hmm. race terminology mm -hmm. group, and we um, just finished writing up a survey and um, it's being sent out um, this week for people to, so, you know, the term mm -hmm. BAME will be replaced and... So it'd be interesting. Yeah. I, if, if, you, if you're as successful as we have been, then you're not going to have an answer. But maybe that's the answer, none of the above. That is the answer. But where does yeah, it I'm take at, you? I'm, yeah. I'm at Hello. Kingston. Yeah, I'm at Kingston. Yeah. So where Karen's from, so that we're looking into replacing it as well. But I don't think we we have a working group. Um, but these are the discussions that are happening. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Should we um? Should we throw people out? I've got the power to throw them. <laughs> yeah, we can decide. <laughs> shall I do it? Yeah, because yeah, yeah, why yeah. Why not? Let's, yeah. let, let, let's let's allow Alex exercise some power. <laughs> so this this is my equivalent of you know the Starship Enterprise. It's going to beam beam <laughs> you. So I'm going to beam you now. I don't know if we'll have a break, but we'll we'll, we'll go about three minutes. Yeah, sounds good. So it's going to leave breakout room in fifty six seconds. Have you got a countdown there? Yeah, is it coming through? So beginning to welcome people back to the main room. I always feel like a, you know, like a fascist, you know, when you, when you press that button to drag everybody back, it's probably the nearest I'll get to becoming a dictator and a fascist. Yeah. So window will know about my okay. views about fascism. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, hopefully so you've got an answer to this uh, problem. <laughs> Um, anyway, we've got a good panel uh, 
uh, we've got a good panel and uh, we will hopefully they'll be, be able to lead us to the promised land yeah hmm. um but we've got according to the program we've got a brief break so um, although we've more or less lost our break but if anybody wants to take a quick break feel free to do so um i haven't got the power to stop you sunder thanks for joining us yeah I don't know if you got if you managed to get any of that the first half, but um, I heard yeah, I heard it all. Oh, um, great just stuff! On, yeah. on my mobile. That's fantastic. That's great to have you. Yeah. So can I'm, I just say something? Can I just, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just thank you everyone for going into your breakout rooms, and I mean I don't know about anyone else, but fascinating conversations. Um, I'm sure were going on. They definitely were in our breakout rooms. Yeah. You would have um, had comments that you shared please can you put them in the chat um and then what i'll try and do is, is capture a couple of salient points when i'm doing my um closing comments so that i kind of represent some of the concerns or some of the feedback that are coming i think i think we've Okay, thanks, Karen, for that. I'm gonna we're gonna go now. In, I, I don't think we've got time for the break, but uh, if anybody needs to have a break, nobody's gonna stop them. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna go to the panel session. I'm gonna hand over back to um, Nonna. Uh, but just to say that um, again, if you have got any questions uh, or points that you'd like to raise, uh, because of the number, it's difficult to have everybody kind of on. Uh, yeah. Stick your hand up or something, and or, or post them, and then I'll keep an eye on that. And uh, Nonna's going to kind of facilitate the panels. So over to you, Nonna. Brilliant. Okay, thanks. So um, we've got a really fantastic panel. So um, I'm not going to waste time doing too much of an introduction. But the first one is, um, you know, I'm going to invite to to speak for to, between five and seven minutes is Dr. Aaron Verma. Aaron is um, currently the head of the Race Equality Charter at Advance HE. Um, he completed his own PhD exploring students' workplace experiences in terms of retention and success through the lens of intersectionality. Um, Aaron has led the integration and embedding of intersectionality and anti-racist practice in government, in the third sector and in academia, both uh, national and global programs and obviously in terms of policy intervention. Um, I, he's obviously got a real um, investment in race equity, so I'm just going to hand over um, to Aaron now. Yeah, and, and if the rest of us uh, switch off our videos, then we should be able to see Aaron in, on, a big, on a big screen there. Is Aaron, Aaron with us? Yeah. Yep. Thanks, Gernon. Hopefully um, my face isn't too scary for everyone. But, no. um, <laughs> thanks so much for the introduction as well and for inviting me to be you know participate in this conversation it's, it's really great to be part of the discussion and the debate on it so I, I believe we talk a few or well, I'll try to talk to five about five minutes on how do we understand the current debate on on this label this category and how can we proceed and I was thinking about reflecting on this in the, in the last week about labels and language uh, and culture and the, the relationships of all those aspects so I was thinking about what the history of the categories are and and what we recognize is that the BME label, it represents homogeneity as a result of people who have non-white skin. And that seems to be what we see through our evidence. It's the sort of grouping of people because of one common characteristic and the shared experience of racism. And it's been about bringing racialized groups together to form solidarity and unity with one another. And it's sort of worked to, to bring ethnic minorities together in a different way. And we see that from the evidence in, in, in different forms too. And that's the way in which um, white researchers around equality and inclusion have, have labeled people of color or the BAME label. And often we see that, that being used throughout discourses and evidence and literature and reports and, and, and so on and so forth. But if we go a little bit further and we look at the answer of anti-racist discourse, the integration, or the rise of critical race theory and intersectionality, we've known for decades that there are now disparities in the success and liberation of communities within this BME group as well. And we notice that there's disparities with other kind of homogenous labels that we look at, for example, the LGBTQI plus um, you know, group category. There's disparities within those individuals that identify differently. 
what I think is interesting is when we start to unpick this label and we start to look at it through the lens of intersectionality, it exposes this notion of the simultaneity of oppressions. And when we look at intersectionality, what we really need to think about is how is the label centering the voice of black people as a starting point for action and intervention design for sustainable change? So if we're, th- if we're taking the argument that language shapes culture and action, how are we using the label to initiate action and advance race equality and or race equity as well? I think what's interesting about this particular label is the reflection of experiences on structural inequalities. I think disaggregation and the BAME label has been useful somewhat in terms of thinking about how we look at data and disaggregation of data. But how does it start to, how does that disaggregation reflect structural inequalities? What does the data or evidence of student and staff pipelines tell us about academic progression, staff progression for for different um, staff groups and communities? What does it tell us about the attainment gap? And those structural aspects are are kind of in conversation when we think about this this label in context of the things that are the issues that we're facing as well. One of the things that kind of uh, I've reflected on recently is a, a personal experience I had in academia when I was asked to review a book on professionalism where the authors continue to use the term non-white throughout the entire book. And that was their way of incorporating inclusion and diversity into their book on professionalism. So I told the senior academics that that I actually felt that this was now is quite offensive that they're creating this homogeneity, they're treating non-white people. Well, firstly, they were using the label non-white, which I didn't agree with, but also they're using it in a way that creates a sense of othering, a second class, a second rate sense, essentially. And what I've noticed when I did feed that back in the review and said that they need to stop using that term, it merely changed the word. And I don't know if it really changed their minds about why that happened or why it was important for that to happen. And I think that's where we need to think about is is the language or the label shifting mindsets? How do we initiate that into action? So in terms of what we're practicing in the Race Quality Charter, we're looking at I believe in spelling out the acronym as a starting point. I know it's not it's not the solution to to referring to people of color or um, Black, Asian, minorities, ethnic. But I feel like spelling it out as a starting point from from my reading and debates as well. But what I'd like to see is what are we doing to get on with race equality action? What I'd like to see is robust actions and interventions that enable things to happen. How can we encourage mindfulness, though, in the language and labels we use, but not be dictated by the perfectionism of language, but be dictated by impact and and achieving and advancing race equality in that respect as well? I think sometimes we we can get into a bit of a trap of the label, but let's think about the label in terms of an action perspective and how we think about that in terms of dismantling or remantling things in in different ways to to create equity in in different spaces and places as well. So those are kind of initial reflections on the debate of of this category and have possibly some opportunities to to kind of provocate where we might think about proceeding and and changing in in the future. Um, I'm not sure if I I filled the seven minutes I was allocated, but hopefully that that was a fair enough reflection. Um, Aaron, you have a few more minutes, so if you wanted to carry on, you please do. I, th- I think I might have run out of bullet points on my... On okay, my, you, you're I, thought I, I thought I timed it. Apologies for that. <laughs> okay, you, sp- you spread through that. So there's some really interesting points, Aaron. You raised, the, for me, the kind of the thing around um, the, the, the solidarity and unity that you create by, by grouping people together and a common identity to kind of fight, but then you misuse of some of the labels that people have been given. And I think what I really took from yours is that, um, you know, the anti-racist discourse um, um, really needs to bring in to its conversation intersectionality and structuralism, structural barriers, because those are the things that um, are needed to keep create a round of debate. So some really interesting points. Thank you. Just, if I could just come in, there's one thing, Aaron, when you talked about the non-white, because I think in the past I've kind of felt fell victim of that myself uh, because I didn't want to essentialize, you know, so non... Uh, so how do we deal with this tension between a label that's sufficiently broad not to essentialize, but not too broad that it becomes absurd and maybe, as you're saying, it becomes part of the white gaze? 
I think for me, when in that particular experience, when um, I picked up on the non-white label, it felt to me that the the authors at the time were were afraid of using the word black to to describe a community of people. Um, but they were more comfortable using the term non-white, but they were afraid of using black or Asian or minority ethnic, mm. because I don't know what that would have meant for them in terms of their book or the way they would have been seen in terms of the optics. But it felt there was a, some, it felt like there was an othering that they felt more comfortable to use the word white than anything else to describe a, a diverse community of people. Um, so that's in that that's in in that context, in which I disagreed with with them in that respect. Mm. Um, and I think we should we we should call the communities as they are as they identify themselves. Um, and currently, I, I believe Black, Asian, minority ethnic, and I'm, I know minority ethnic in itself is probably a homogenous group <laughs> as well. And there's 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 some further detail within that. Um, but from my understanding, at this point in time, Black and Asian are, are still kind of significant ways in which people identify then communities identify themselves um so things any further we use those those terms that they that we feel comfortable with just to come back on that and then others might want to pick up as i was saying in my talk i mean the black category has been fought over if you read the work of stuart hall steve and others it was fought over it was a riposte colonialization yeah and and black power the asian category was produced by the foreign and commonwealth office uh, when Idi Amin threw out the so-called Ugandan Asians because they were originally Indians when they came to East Africa. And they didn't know what to call them because if we call them Indians, some of them are from India, they're from other parts of, 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 of old India. So, so somebody said, oh, well, we'll call them Asians. So it was a foreign and Commonwealth office that determined, it wasn't Asians that determined this category. I've never met an Asian saying, hey, I'm an Asian. Anyway, back to you, Nana. That is true. Uh, okay, I, I just want to move on now. Thank you very much, Arun. I want to move on now to Sundar, uh, to Larissa Kennedy first. So, Larissa, uh, welcome. Um, you just wanted to give a brief bio for Larissa is the current president of the National Union of Students. So, welcome. Really pleased to have you. And the student voice is incredibly important here. Um, so, um, Larissa has. Um, 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 been between 2018 and 2020. She served on the NUS National Executive Council and was also a member of the NUS Black Students Campaign. Um, Doris is the granddaughter of the Windrush generation and was born in London and grew up in Croydon, South London. And from the age of 16, she became politically well, active in the student politics. Um, and so while studying politics, international studies and Hispanic studies at University of Warwick, she founded the Warwick Decolonized Project. Um, and so Larissa has been the education officer and deputy president um, at Warwick Student Union. So um, welcome and I hope you're enjoying your position on the NUS. Thank you so much for the introduction. And yeah, I'm having a great time at NUS uh, and it's really great to be with you. So thank you so much you're for welcome. having me. Um, so I suppose in terms of my, my musings or on the question around language uh, when it comes to race, um, I think it, I, I want to start this off by just talking about the limitations of language, I guess, because we all know, you know, a very basic fact that race is socially constructed. And so any of the language that we're using around this is always going to be in opposition and in or rather in extraction of whiteness, right? It's always going to be about whiteness um, as a, a normalized form of the way that our world functions and the ways that you know whiteness causes the need for forms of solidarity and so on. So I don't think there's ever going to be perfect language. That doesn't mean I don't think there could be better language. Um, but you know, for me, whether we're talking about BAME, ethnic and minority, political blackness, black and brown, POC, people of global majority, all of those things at the end of the day are you know directly because of white supremacy and whiteness and I just wanted to call that out from the beginning to 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 underline everything I'm going to say by there's not going to be perfect language um but what I do want to unpack a little bit with the few minutes that I have is kind of the the question of 
invisibility, hypervisibility, and erasure, and how language can function um, to perpetuate certain problems around those things. Um, because I think when we're looking at, um, you know, the, 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 you know, waning use of, of political blackness, when we're looking at terms like BAME and the reasons that they're kind of highly contentious, it's often related to these three pillars. Um, because I, you know, personally as a black woman, but also from discussions within the Black Students Campaign, um, we've always talked about the the ways in which we find the invisib invisibilization, particularly of black folks um, and of black marginalized folks with language such as BAME, ethnic minority, and then also with political blackness. Um, what we often see is the category BAME used um, as a kind of sticking plaster for huge disparities among uh, different black and brown communities. Um, and, you know, this has been evident, you know, in, in the pandemic uh, more, than, more than ever before, where, you know, we've seen particularly, uh, for example, uh, Bangladeshi communities, Caribbean communities, uh, differentially impacted than others. Um, and, and the need to break that down is to avoid the kind of invisibilization of what the actual patterns are and what's actually going on underneath. And so I think it's really important that we don't use BAME to kind of cover up or um, try and delegitimize um, the kind of the vastness of some of the issues that we're talking about. I think another area where this is really, really clear um, is when we're talking about the black attainment gap. And I say that in quotation marks um, distinctly um, because often people are using statistics around the BAME attainment gap um, in order to you know, cover up how horrendous the black attainment gap or awarding gap rather really is. Um, and so I think when we start to dig into some of the, the reasons that language is being chosen or being explicitly used, um, it's, it, it starts to kind of uh, give a, a kind of more tainted picture of the word. Kind of thinking now about hypervisibility. Um, I think that there are certain things uh, around uh, language like BAME, uh, language like ethnic minority, which are inherently othering. Um, and so who is it visibilizing and who um, is it purposely um, positioning as the other? And then when it comes to erasure, um, I think a lot of the um, problems inherent to all of that language, as I said at the beginning, is that they're erasing that these, these names, these labels come from different places, right? Uh, BAME has always been a kind of technocratic term that was used to identify communities, whereas other terms like people of colour, POC, came from communities themselves. Uh, and so people of colour was never meant to be this overarching, um, all-consuming term that we used without designations within it. Um, it was started, or at least some of its origin story, was in political solidarity. Um, there's a really interesting uh, video on YouTube of uh, someone called Loretta Ross, uh, and she was the kind of co-founder um, and national coordinator of Sister Song. And she talks about being um, in Houston in, in 1977 at the National Women's Conference at the time. Um, and you and kind of seeing the, the kind of birthing moment of, of this term in one way. Um, of course, it kind of probably picked up in, in lots of different spaces, but she says one of the birthing moments for her of this term, uh, women of color, uh, was when people were bringing, um, you know, this plank, this uh, commitment statement of all the things that they wanted for minority women. Um, and kind of parallel to that, black women uh, had created themselves a kind of um, black women's agenda, which was far more extensive. Um, and so when it was brought to the table at the, the, the National Women's Conference, um, people felt that they wanted to substitute the black women's agenda for the minority women's plank or, or the other kind of uh, thing that had been put on the agenda already. And so when this went to happen, they just felt that there was a need to 
um, separate from what was the black women's agenda and what was the, the minority women's agenda to bring that together in a form of solidarity. Uh, and so Ross talks about the fact that these weren't just descriptions, they weren't kind of biological designations. These were about political solidaristic kind of ideological histories, right? It was about a political um, commitment um, to stand up for one another's liberation. Um, and so when we look at that uh, and, and the kind of foundations of that term, as opposed to the likes of BAME, uh, which of course in and of itself is very clinical and is used as this kind of um, othering designation, I think we can see then how that's kind of um, been taken away from, those terms have been taken away from their context uh, and why they're often contentious now. Um, so I'm not actually sure how long I've been talking for, so I just want to check in that I'm not going away over time. Um, um, but yeah, you've, I guess the, you've got a couple of more minutes, Larissa. Okay, thank you. So I guess the, the I guess the main thing I wanted to get across is that these terms have different origins, uh, and so those stories mean that they are used differently. Um, that the kind of removal of that origin can be violent um, in kind of erasing the need for, for solidarity and for the, the kind of political nature of them to be the center of things. Um, and that, you know, things like people of color were never um, built to erase those differential histories and differential needs, but in fact, to build links upon which people could organize collectively um, towards liberation. The kind of last thing I wanted to touch on was people of global majority, because this is a term um, that I've kind of seen um, banding around um, in the background a little bit, uh, growing um, uh, ever slowly. Um, and I think it's an interesting one to me because it's the first term that from my perspective um, flips the switch and flips the narrative um, and is the kind of antithesis of what I was saying at the top of um, speaking here in, in terms of being kind of uh, not centralizing whiteness. Um, and so I think it's a really interesting term that, you know, if we have the space to, I'd love to discuss. Um, but yeah, just wanted to mention that because it's often forgotten or, or not necessarily noted um, as something among these discussions. Um, and of course, I can't kind of wrap up without noting the fact that as Nona said at the beginning, um, NUS remains the Black Students Campaign. Um, and, you know, I think part of that is a, is a, you know, a recognition that we stand on the shoulders of giants in the, in the context in which um, the, the Black Students Campaign was founded. That was the term that spoke to the kind of solidaristic nature of that campaign. And of course, that was kind of what um, kind of spilled out into the, the future of that campaign. But a second one is because try as we might, we've done polls, we've had debates, uh, we've gone round and forth, back and front, we cannot find a term um, to settle on. Uh, and I guess I just wanted to end with that to say that this isn't kind of a, a, an open and shut case. There is not, I can't kind of recommend this term over the other. I can mention that, you know, within the student movement, the kind of more popular terms are definitely um, recognizing uh, the, our actual kind of designations in terms of black and Asian. Um, and, um, you know, the, within that, the kind of specificity um, of where we come from, because, you know, personally, um, I'm West Indian, that's how I um, kind of identify. Um, but that students of color remains really popular and it remains something that people like to recognize the history of, build on that strong history um, and, and stop allowing that to become whitewashed um, and to stop the erasure of the fact that this was a kind of political organizing language and term. Well, fantastic, Larissa, you've given us so, so much we want to talk about, but um, I'm so conscious of time. You know, uh, your, your idea about the global majority was a point that came up in, in, our, in, in my group earlier um, uh, and how it does spin the conversation around. But we'll come back to you. Um, and people, please do put some questions in, in the um, uh, possibly succinct questions so we can pick them up, Gunan can pick, Gunan can pick them up whilst we are uh, moving on to our final speaker, who is a panel member, who is Sundar Kadwala. Uh, Sunda is uh, the director of British Futures, an independent think tank, um, and that explores um, um, 
um, and uh, um, explores public attitudes on issues such as immigration, integration, race and identity. And um, recently, some of the led uh, on a survey entitled Beyond Bain himself, and what do the public think? Um, previously, he was General Secretary of the Fabian Society and was a leader, writer and internet editor for The Observer. Uh, he also written pieces for The Guardian, New Statesman and um, The Spectator. And um, I'm going to hand over to you now with your five to seven minutes, if I may. Thank you very much. And thanks for um, inviting me to be part of this um, part of this event. I think it's a really useful thing to have this conversation, to have the conversation, you know, with research informing it, to have a reflective conversation that re reflects the pluralism of how people think about these, these issues. Rich Futures is a non-partisan think tank and charity. Um, I've got some research findings that I've put in the chat. I won't go into the great detail of them. They align quite a lot with the findings that, that, that you've got. And I suppose reflecting on what, what we were hearing earlier about the research you've been doing, I think you know some insights that jump out about that is it's really important to have the conversation, try and reflect people's identities, and don't expect a consensus to arise from that conversation. You know, there are 8 million people of different ethnic minority backgrounds in our country of different generations, of different ethnic groups, of different educational backgrounds, you know, all sorts of other differences, 15 million other people in this conversation, we hope, you know, in a, in a, in a useful way. And so there isn't going to be this magic consensus, as, as we saw in the research. We've got a lot of different subjective views. So what do we do with that? How do we act? What are our objectives and what audiences? I want to just try and reflect on some of that. This enormously subjective stuff. And, you know, we, we make our own personal choices about how we use language. We make our personal choices in a, you know, in a context. You know, I would use, I would use the language. It's not a perfect term, but I would use the language about myself, mixed race. If I'm describing myself. If you want to know what kind of mixed it is, then I can tell you I'm sort of, you know, a bit Indian, a bit Irish Catholic, you know, English, British, sort of Scouse Essex, you know, whatever other bits I could put into it. Um, so, but then, you know, what aggregate term goes with that? So most people identify with more specifics, um, but, you know, there are debates then about what aggregate terms you want. Um, the late broadcaster Darkus Howe said to me several years ago, he said, Sunder, mixed race, what is this nonsense you're talking, Sunder? If you're not white, you're black. And obviously I had that conversation with, you know, people I was at university in the mid nineties and people who were Asian and mixed race didn't tend to do that, call themselves black. And yet their, their peers would have done that 15 years before. And if, if people were doing that, if I was a student now and I was doing that, other people might say to me, what, what, what are you doing with that? That's not, it's not how we're doing. So there's a, there's an evolution, a change. I was explaining to my 14 year old daughter, who's sort of in that sense, second generation mixed race that she might have identified as black if she'd gone to university in so she had no concept that she could that she could do that you know the way in which she would support you know black lives matter isn't through identifying as black she supports it for other for other reasons so it's very subjective and i think that's where we can get caught on this on this thing just some i've got one complicating point for this conversation uh, and one i think helpful point um, about about how to move forward. The complicating point is that, you know, this is quite, you know, an emotional intensive discussion, lots of strong views in it and no consensus as we saw. There are also incredibly variable public levels of engagement with this debate. And that's something to factor in that I think can go missing a bit in the, in the university conversation. So, you know, when we just asked people, have you heard of the BAME term? You know, we were, you know, 40% of people have got a strong idea of what that is. And a third of people have got no idea about what it is. And, you know, another group of people who've um, got some idea what it might be about, but they don't know. And, um, and that's, by the way, very low awareness among 18 to 34 year olds from ethnic minority backgrounds. About a third, a third and a third in those campaigns. Now, there's a big split of older ethnic minority people more aware of this debate than younger people, but graduates more aware than non-graduates. Um, and so, so the, you know, the non-graduate ethnic minority group, you know, not as represented then in the NUS debates and so on, uh, and in the debates on campus, but might be a really important audience for you when you're doing access and inclusion. And so, and so, uh, you know, a real distinction between, you know, the people who are very engaged with what do we do with these seven terms, and, you know, which ones we choose, and people who aren't quite across this. The thing that surprised me most, I had sort of 10 small deliberative conversations across the country uh, when we were doing this research. It's, um, so some people were aware 
uh, younger people in London, especially other people in London, and then people who worked in HR or in the arts and culture or in youth work, were really aware we were having a term about this debate and where were there or not to move on from it. But I met more people who thought we were introducing the term BAME and that had come in with the coronavirus and that this was a discussion about whether to introduce this term, which they'd started to hear in the previous 12 months on the BBC. So again, just a, you know, just a, a surprising level of difference there in terms of where people think we are in this conversation. And that might mean that the conversations you're having to have a consensus on campus between the staff, the institution and the students and the conversation you're having maybe in engaging with parents and potential students, you might need to think differently then about the accessibility. One big lesson comes out of that, use words, not acronyms. And if you're going to use BAME, spell it out. And that's really popular for two reasons. One is that it reminds people that if you're using an aggregate term, it's a plurality of other things and that there's lots in it. And it lets quite a lot of people know what you're talking about. Uh, instead of having to say, is this something about race? I think, you know, is this what it's about and so on. So that's, um, you know, words, not acronyms is really popular and actually takes quite a lot of the heat out of this. You, you found in your survey there, um, you know, if you try and do a sort of Euro 2020 knockout cup, then, you know, someone will win in the end, but it's pretty even before them. We actually asked a different question. We asked people's favourite terms. We also asked for acceptable, indifference and unacceptable. And the interesting thing we got was a very high degree of pragmatism. So the unacceptable scores for all of these terms are very low. There's no consensus, but there's quite a lot of put up with it in its context and don't really care going on. And so, you know, ethnic minority, for example, scores 68% acceptable, 13% unacceptable. Um, BAME does a little bit worse, but quite similarly, even non-white, it's got 30% unacceptable. It's got a majority for acceptable. I think many people will share the view that was expressed about why you should move beyond it and there are better terms, but it's quite interesting to me, the pragmatism. So something interesting came out and then, and then very high spot, Larissa was just saying, very high spot, we survey our black respondents and our Asian respondents separately. Umbrella terms black and Asian have a lot of legitimacy and so do the specific national terms that go below it. And faith terms have a lot of legitimacy for people who identify with their faith which is quite a lot of people, but of course not everybody. And so again, you're not gonna see, you know, you're not gonna see an overlap because different people of a Pakistani Muslim background will identify primarily as Muslim or not identify with their faith. So, so we're dealing with this overlapping thing, but there's actually a lot of pragmatism. What came out in the deliberative conversations was really, really interesting because people start off with an aversion to all of this, for all of the good reasons that you've been talking about. We put ourselves in boxes too much. And when they then think about the pros and cons of doing this or not doing this, they decide that we should do it, but we should be clear about why we're doing it. And they want reasons as to why it's happening. If it's done for a purpose, that's fine. And people start off with a sense of implied permission to collect this data for health services, because they understand why health services might want it and what they might do with it. And everyone else, they want more of a reason. And they're quite persuadable for employers and education, but they're also not sure. And when we gave people categories of things we might collect, one category was, did your parents go to university? And in almost every group, um, somebody said, oh, that sounds really bad. You know, are employers going to be discriminating against people who didn't go to university? And then somebody with some background in education would say, maybe it's a way of finding out how to reach out to people who didn't go to university. Maybe it'd be good to collect it for that reason. And then everybody would say, we should collect it for that reason, that sounds sensible, but it wasn't their intuition that that was why it was being collected. They're actually suspicious of why you would be collecting that. Was this a class-based way to discriminate against people whose parents didn't have education rather than was this an outreach thing? So the most important lesson I think is to differentiate the identity debate, very subjective, and we should all decide for ourselves and we should try and in a group with a person, find out what people think from the data debate and then explain what the data is doing, why it's good and what proper purpose it's being used for. And then people care much less about what category label you've put on the data. They would prefer black, Asian and minority ethnic to BAME. And people don't want to be talked about BAME people. No one thinks themselves a BAME person, but they will be okay with the collection of data and their statistics being anonymously put into these boxes if they trust the institution's reasons for collecting that data and what they're doing. And then they're doing it in all the detail and the disaggregation and the micro detail to check, you know, who's really struggling in this complex pattern. So um, the big opportunity then is there's pragmatism 
about what we do, as long as people feel they've had a voice and a chance to share their views about their identity and their views about what they would trust you to do with the data that reflects their identity. Okay, brilliant. Thank you ever so much. We have had such fantastic um, 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 panel um, in uh, key points. And I, I think now is the opportunity for us to, to really dig a little bit deeper. So there's a couple of questions. Gernon, please chip in and anybody else who... If I maybe if I together. come in and in a sense, this is a question for everybody, but I want to start with Sunder because he made reference to Darkest Howell's kind of challenge to you. And, and, and clearly Darkest was coming from a very political kind of perspective, from a, what you might call a post-colonial perspective, yeah? That, and, and I talked about Du Bois in my presentation, the colour line. How do you see, I mean, why are so many people talking about, why is it an issue now? And why was it an issue for the Sewell Commission? You know, and remember the Sewell Commission said, get rid of black in a sense, but also get rid of institutionalized racism. Do you think there's a political move here as well? Look, the, the Sewell Commission, you know, you all have your views about it. It was a highly polarizing debate that we had, in my view, too polarizing a debate. And I think the government and the commission itself contributed to that. I think the media contributed to that. I think to some extent, some of those critical responses contributed to it. But what is interesting is the one point of consensus, actually, in, from all different political strands, is that the BAME term is not very good. Now, there are different reasons why people are critiquing that. And um, you're you know, expressing some skepticism about why people might remove an aggregate category that's good for solidarity. But actually, we've heard from you know, the opposite end of the political spectrum why you would be skeptical about the umbrella term. So actually, the consensus that the umbrella term is less good than digging beneath it is very, very clear. And then there are different political agendas, you know, colorblind liberal centrism, you know, right wing anti-anti-racism, yeah. left-wing anti-racism, they all, all have different views. But the, what, what is different between British attitudes and French attitudes in particular, and you're obviously operating in an international context, is that, that that pragmatism for collecting data on balance, even though you want to put into boxes, is where the public consensus is. If you actually look at French data, the kind of never ask anybody and never put anything in a box thing is very, very high. And so there is there's less auditing obviously in statistical collecting of race, it's much more contentious to collect at all. In Britain, the objections to collecting and categorizing are quite sophisticated and they're not, I think, objections in principle to using data to tackle yeah, ethnic yeah. disadvantage. Just, Larissa, I'm just wondering if you want to come in because NUS you know, has held on to political blackness. Um, and, 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 and so do you think that the politics are in this debate might be kind of kind of uh, removed by you know not having some collective term that is the fear i think and I, I think it's wrong to try and legitimize um you know other concerns be that kind of liberal conversations or far-right conversations about race that actually erase what anti-racist organizers have been saying and are saying um, and you know we'll continue to debate and I think it's really important that the terms that we use come from communities directly um, and come from that place of you know, solidarity and community and wanting to liberate ourselves as opposed to latching onto language that is set up solely to kind of bureaucratize our lived experiences mm. like I think that's why BAME is so you know people are just quite um, you know, aloof about it or, or don't connect with it or find it in, in, insulting in some cases where people call you a BAME person. Mm -hmm. It's because that never came from our communities. It was yeah. never a political endeavor to be recognized as BAME. I'm not BAME, are, are you BAME? Like I just, and I think like I, while I wouldn't primarily identify as a woman of color, when I'm sitting alongside you know, the, you know, as a, as a black woman sitting alongside and organizing alongside um, other women of color, I'm very proud to call myself a woman of color in that context. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the kind of specificity of it is so, so it's the, like, kind of political- Different context than you, you mobilize different kind of ways of you know, kind of identifying politically, yeah? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Aaron, uh, you're working on intersectionality. And some of these debates have been happening in other oppressed groups as well around 
sexually, uh, into sexual identity and others as well. Is this part of the pattern of fragmentation of these kind of political collectivities? So I, get, I think currently, and then the way, if we look at the history of intersectionality and the way it was conceived, it was essentially a reaction to dismantle structural inequalities. So where people of people of color, black women in particular, who were seeking liberation through the legal systems for um, getting help for uh, experiences of domestic abuse and so on and so forth. That's where the, the, the history comes from. It comes from the, the, the notion of the simultaneity of oppressions, the anti-racist literature and so on and so forth. And it is very Americanized in the way it's situated. And it's very heavy on structures because there's a hell of a lot of structures in the, the American system and the federal um, regulations and governance there as well. If we translate it into the UK context, we've kind of focused a lot on identity and characteristics. We've used intersectionality as a frame and a lens for disaggregating data. And that's a really, again, a really useful thing for us to do because we do need to have that data. We need to understand what are our, our pipelines in, in, in the student staff um, progression, success, retention, those kinds of things. We need to have that. We, 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 we can't affect change without knowing that information. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, at this point, data systems are limited by the BAME labels. So we have to think about how do we shift that for things like the census or things like HESA and, and stuff like that? So for data perspectives, we're, we're, we're quite limited at the moment that we're restricted to the BAME label and that does need to change and reflect diversity within, the, within this group or this label as well. One of the things that would be nice to get to, and I think in terms of intersectionality and, and speaking about the fragmentation of it, um, one of the things we forget is that identities are fluid, they change, they don't change as such, but they people identify in different places and spaces and contexts, and that's something we need to recognize. Yeah. Um, so for myself, I might describe myself as a South Asian to a certain group of people, um, but in an LGBT group, I might describe myself as a gay man of color. So it, it changes and it shifts in different spaces, depending on who's around me and then where I feel safe to say what I want to say. So that's kind of something to, to think about. In terms of what, would, and I, th I think it speaks a bit to Sundar and Larissa's comments, is what would be nice to get to is if we could focus on the outcome of advancing race equality, of achieving anti-racism, who are the communities within that outcome or goal or impact mission or whatever you want to call it, do we need to involve to get there? Mm -hmm. And if it so happens to be black, um, a different um, black, Asian and minority ethnic groups to get there, then, then let's focus on the outcome, then the language. Pragmatic politics, but, a kind of pragmatism in that politics, which Sunder talked about. No, no, I'll hand back to you, because I thought I know you had a couple of questions. Go. Yeah, but I, I, I do, but I think that the richness of the debate has actually covered a lot of them. I, for me, I think, um, you know, there's some comments in there about saying, well, we need to have the data, otherwise we can't, um, uh, we can't progress. And But other, other people are saying, um, let me identify let me define my identity. I don't need someone else to do that. But the problem now is how do you marry those two? And what, what, what are the next steps really in that debate? Because that, that's the polarization. Um, because otherwise, how do we collect the data if people do not want to be labeled? I think, Owen, that's a good one for you as well, because um, you know, from the race charter mark, you're actually you know, suggesting that um, collecting data against different categories and intersectionality is really critical to progressing it. So what do we do? I think it comes back to the, the comment about being mindful about what we're collecting and how it, the disaggregation of data based on ethnic categories is a starting point. Um, we, we do need to understand, but, but, but we also need to be mindful that the data systems that higher education institutions have are somewhat limited. There's lots of gaps for different institutions at different points, um, and, and that does limit the, inter the, the interventions or the actions that can be really designed to, to advance race equality. And I think this is where, um, this is kind of a similar along the principle of thinking about the label of BAME, for example, is using it as a starting point, but not being held or dictated by it as the, as the only thing to, to advance race equality. I think at this point, there's an opportunity to shed light on furthering um, disaggregating data within the BAME label further and encouraging national 
and institutional data systems to really speak to that because we are quite limited. I think there's some institutions and some systems that still don't disaggregate different black sub-ethnicities as well within that. And so there's a conflation of black African and black Caribbean that we, we see quite often yeah. in organizations, which, which is problematic as the experiences of, of either uh, of, of very unique. Um, so that's something that, that needs to be that needs to be addressed uh, specifically. And, and as Gernam, you mentioned, the the nuances within the Asian group yeah. need to be need to be addressed mm -hmm. as well. So it's a starting point. Um, there needs to be a governance ch shift to, to kind of encourage that. Um, and, and I think the more we can, the more data we can get on that, mm -hmm. the more we can design meaningful actions. But having said that, we need to center the voices of black people and black communities at the heart of the action design and intervention what, what, what design. What do you mean by black there? Black African? How are you using black there? So I'm using the black, the term black in terms of the black community more broadly. So all encompassing in the UK black? sector. Using as political black. Um, I, I've never been too familiar with the the political. The reason why I'm saying term, is that so... we often we often switch codes and and without realizing it, and and that's part of the problem. So we might use, we all do it. I do it all the time. I'm I'm kind of black Asian, and and, and a lot of other things in the same conversation. I mean. Just one last question, and we're running out of time, but both of the Larissa and Sunder, really. Larissa, you could... What about the white, the kind of people who are, who are in power? Should they be turned into an ethnic group as well? You know, white seems to kind of preserve itself. It kind of reproduces itself without any problems. Um, so, I mean, I think I almost want to flip the, the question on its head because mm -hmm. I think, you know, I, I've been thinking as we've been going through this conversation about, for example, like Fred Hampton's... Rainbow Coalition, which was about, you know, you know, be it white people, black people, non-black people of color, um, across the spectrum who were working class and building solidarity. And that being a great example of the fact that this is about po political solidarity as opposed to about labels. But yeah, I mean, whiteness will always reproduce itself because of the, the, the kind of, uh, domineering nature of of the kind of white supremacy right like that is its function um that is its it, its prerogative like that's why it exists it's yeah, we're, we're Sunday, you want to come in yeah, yeah. sorry yeah. Sunday, i think i think the categories you've been using are going to get are going to get shaken up much more now because i think i think we inherit a lot of language from essentially post-war commonwealth migration and the ethnic um playing out of that in British society. There's another debate going on in America. Education in the UK, I think, is probably one of the best sectors at having the sort of granularity that Aaron is looking for, um, you know, so that we can break it down. But, you know, there are going to be new groups, you know, white minority groups, you know, Romanians, where you're going to want to be disaggregating that data. And the way we think about the ethnic minority category and the majority category don't, don't work particularly well for the different groups. The mixed category is going to be very, very large, but there are going to be very different things going on in it. So this granularity is going to be really important. The answer to what to do is I think if you consult people, context, context, context is what matters. So, you know, if there's a group self-organizing for any reason, it has a conversation about the label it wants to use, and that's great. But data needs some degree of stability, but it should be tested. Create a panel of students of different diverse backgrounds and involve them in how you're using data, how you're explaining it, what it's for, what it's not for, and be open to challenge. The biggest issue for intersectionality in this country is that there is no stable or agreed way to talk about what we mean when we're talking about class. And it would be really, really good with the minority data to get a better class. We've already got free school meals data, but there's a lot going on in class. And that is the barrier. We're having this very polarized debate about does talking about class, stop talking about race, et cetera. But the practical point is we haven't really got enough tools to integrate race and class. And until we have that, we'll be stuck on this. Okay, I think we run out of town now. No. Yeah, we have. And I just um, I just want to say thank you to, to Sunda, Owen and Larissa and again, Lenan for that fantastic debate. Uh, we've got us. Uh, we've got to go to the next part of the program, which we have ten minutes left. There's Eight minutes now. <laughs> the fantastic uh, points um, uh, questions are in the chat, and we, we do need to look at those. Um, so handing over now to to Karen Lipsedge to to close reflections on the se session based upon some of the comments that were made in the 
in the groups, uh, the breakout rooms. So handing over to you, Karen, thank you. Thank you very much. So, so I've got the rather unwieldy task of trying to bring this all, all together and um, I'm not going to be able to capture anything, everything, but I'm going to give it a go. So the, the fantastic comments. Um, this is side stage in the chat. Karen, you're cutting Can out. Can you hear um, maybe, me? Maybe you should put your video off because you are cutting Camera off. off. Yeah. Can you hear me a bit better now? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's the chat. Um, things about who is involved in the discussion, who's allowed to participate in a conversation about racial and ethnic categories. Um, should we separate those? Um, and I guess kind of if, if, if we're thinking about our purpose, should everyone involved in creating an anti-racist institution being involved in the conversation about racial and ethnic terminology, ultimately what's needed is to create a safe um, space for discussion um, the other one is about um, need for an appropriate system for identifying inequality, not to get a number of comment people made comments about the fact that we shouldn't get distracted by categorization and get distracted away from thinking about racial um, inequity, um, that we need terminology that is both fluid but also it is more granular that enables us to build solidarity. Regardless of what we do, we need to be clear about why we're doing it, what we're using it for, what we're using categories for. Um, and also just kind of bring it back to comments that were made earlier, that idea of being able to challenge um, label to categories, labels, requires privilege and to kind of really remember that. Um, is it possible just to be um, in a 21st century, not to be categorized? Lots of comments coming up that I don't want to be categorized. Is it possible to disaggregate the personal from the political? Isn't all, isn't all everything that's personal, political and the need for specificity. Um, to bring it together as we kind of move forward in in the less than five minutes that I've got. I think the fact that we've had so many people coming today really testifies to the, the fact that there's a Karen, we keep losing you. To have done. I can't, there's nothing I can do. You're not hearing me at all. No, hearing you now, you keep fading in and out. So sorry. Carry on. Sorry, now. no, I'm sorry. I just I'm just dealing with <laughs> with the with the bandwidth I've got. Um yeah. so should I keep yeah, keep going. going? Yeah. I think we've lost. So we need enough. to find out uh, about what is the aim? Thinking about a suitable mechanism for capturing the collective K universities today. Well, the workshop also okay, reminded us, I think, is Karen. I'm going yeah. to stop you there if that's okay, because you keep you cutting out far too much for it to to actually. Um, but can I ask you to? to I'm sorry. There's nothing I can. Yeah. That's fine, but can I ask you to, to just make a few notes and bullet points of what you're going to say and we'll, we can distribute that to the group. So thank you very much. Um, with four minutes left, I just want to um, say, uh, Gurnam, thank you. Yeah. For yeah. Getting your name right. Gurnam, thank you very yeah. much for um, all the work you put in to making this event happen. You have um, really driven uh, us all to, to, to this point amidst a bit, very busy time of the year. So thank you very much. Thank you to all the contributors to the paper and to the panel members.
and especially a big thank you to everybody who's joined in today. Um, I hope you agree it's been a fantastic event. Um, we, we just want to say I would like Larissa, if she's still around, to close the event with a last comment from the Student Union, um, the NUS, if you are still with us. No, she no. Okay, she's gone. Yeah. Can, so, can, I just, can I just say... Go for it, go for it. I mean, I think the important thing is that we don't allow these conversations about labels to distract us from the struggle against racism. And, and, and whatever level we are, you know, we have to be really wary that we don't lose the anti-racist movement uh, and solidarity. And that's my fear, is that we might be pitched against each other. And we've got to really think that one through because that is what the white man's game is. That was the game of the white man in colonial times. And this is what white power is doing now. So we do need to be wary of that. But also, you can't stand still either. You know, we can't stand still. It's a moving target. It's a moving struggle. And I think even Fanon told us about that. You know, this, this beast called racism doesn't stand still. It keeps kind of coming and coming and coming. And so we have to respond each in each moment. Thank you very much. OK, with that, I'm going to say, say goodbye to you all. And I hope that you have a, a really good evening. Um, enjoy the rest of the week. Bye bye. Thank you as well, Nana. Thank you. We could maybe just hang on for five minutes. Just to, yeah. yeah, let's do that. Mm. I'm going to stop the recording now, by the way. Oh, let's stop the recording.